You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. Hey, it's Jordan. If you're listening to this episode, it's because the Queen is dead. And beyond much of the world mourning, one of the largest and most important figures of the past century, a gigantic, intricate machine, is swinging into motion around the world right now. This is not a new episode. We recorded it in 2019, when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was very much alive. And we're resurfacing it now to give you an inside look at what is happening in Buckingham Palace, in the royal family, in the United Kingdom, and around the world. When the Queen dies, this is what happens next. One very sad day in the coming months or years, bells around the world will toll in a way that has not occurred in the living memory of most people on this planet. His Majesty the King passed peacefully away at a few minutes before 12. It has been more than 66 years since Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II ascended the throne. During her record-setting reign, she has come to define royalty for a huge portion of the world's population. But what is royalty in a rapidly changing world or even in a rapidly changing monarchy? What happens in the hours and days after Her Majesty, who is now 93, passes away? What will change in the Commonwealth, in Canada, in the world, and even in her own family in the months and years that follow that? The royal family is one of the last visible links between Canada and the United Kingdom, and it is woven into our government in a way that most of us probably forgot after that grade school civics class. But the invisible ties are deep, and the Queen's passing will test them in ways that they've never been tested. So when the Queen is dead, how does her reign live on? Rawlings, and this is The Big Story. Patricia Treble is one of Canada's preeminent royal watchers and reporters. She is a correspondent for Maclean's, and you can find her at rightroyalty.com. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Jordan. How prepared is the world, um, especially Canada, but I guess just the world in general, for uh, what you called uh, in your piece for Maclean's the inevitable when Queen Elizabeth II passes? Queen Elizabeth II, I'm going to say. Just, See, there you go. Just we'll to set back the tone. Up. Queen Elizabeth II is a ship. Right here. Um, she's simply the queen. If you if you if you go around the world, she's been she's been monarch for so long. If you go around the world and you ask kids to draw a queen, they will draw her. Right. They'll put a tiara or a crown on her and they will draw her. Are we prepared? I mean, she's ninety three. Yeah. I mean, we know that the inevitable. There's actually a legal term. It's called the demise of the crown, which I thought oh, sent a shiver down my throat, my spine. I don't think anyone's prepared for it. There are people who have made plans for it. We know what's going to happen. We know it's inevitable. I mean, she's 93. Yeah. But I think it's going to catch everyone off guard, and it's going to be far more, far larger and far more emotional, even though those of us who've really thought about it know it's going to catch everyone off guard. Well, a while ago, when we were both working for the same publication, you kind of walked me through what happens exactly when the queen dies. And it was it was fascinating because you can can you explain the protocol like the on the ground protocol so this isn't something they put together at the last minute royal officials have been planning this and they update their plans for decades we know that the queen's funeral the whole the 10 days from her death to her funeral is called london bridge and so the first thing that obviously happens you know is that her family is informed and then the palace officials will inform the prime minister of britain and the protocol is, is simply London Bridge has fallen. I mean, you, that's the code, and everyone knows what that means, and that kicks an, a plan into place. So the realm countries, so can, nations that have the Queen as head of state, Canada, Australia, there's 16 around the world, including Britain, they are informed. The governor generals are informed. So everyone's informed in behind the scenes, and everything's kicking into place. And what every every nation has is they have, there's a box in a closet somewhere and it has black armbands, and the black armbands are put on the left arm, closest to the heart. 
you are in mourning for her. And so you'll see everyone, you know, news announcers will have, everyone has black, a black jacket in their newsroom, on a closed tree somewhere, and that's put on. And then what's happened is the, um, the announcement will be made through the press association, and instantly everyone around the world will break into broadcasts. You know, it is with the greatest sadness that Buckingham Palace has announced. Mm-hmm. Da, da, da. And what also happens is that everything stops. So if you're on a hip-hop, listening to a hip-hop station, uh, you know, you're going down the highway, all of a sudden the music will turn. Because this is the sort of thing they prepare for, not just the Queen, but huge disasters. You know, the preparations are done, especially in Britain, they're done very regularly because they don't want to catch people off guard. And it can. So when the Queen Mother died in 2002, it was Easter weekend, and the officials famously told the announcer that he didn't have to change his tie. He was going to put on a black tie. And they said, oh, no, no, you know, she's 101. Did it. Nobody's mm. going to be really that interested. The blowback was significant, and they learned a lesson. And they also thought, they thought, oh, she's, you know, she's been around forever. There's not going to be that much interest. People were lined up to walk by her coffin at Westminster Hall. They were lined up, up, over, and under, something like eight bridges in London. Westminster Hall was open 23 hours a day. It only closed one hour so that they could simply clean it. It's the kind of thing that to people that don't engage with the monarchy much, you kind of forget about it because it's been stable for so long. And and it lets you maybe not realize the weight of what's going to come when something like this happens. Well, I mean, think about it. She's been on the throne for 67 years. So she is now, and she's 93. So she's been working three decades past the normal time people retire and she's still going. So I did statistics and I realized that for Canadians, something like more than 85% of Canadians have known no other monarch. Yeah. They were born in her reign. Many died in her reign. And so the change will be, will be just shocking. I mean, in many ways, your, your daily life is going to continue. You're going to go to work. You're going to do everything else. Sure. But there is this underlying fundamental process that there will be, as I I said to somebody, I said, the last breath of the queen is immediately followed by the first intake of breath of the new king, and that will be Charles. There is no doubt anyone who has this theory that they're somehow going to bypass him and go to William. A lot of people would like to see that. I don't know why, because William has a young family, and the duties are so so onerous, because people think, oh, she doesn't really do much. She she does a lot. They, you know... And the governor general here and the vice regals, the the lieutenant's governor, they do a lot. So that why would you want a man who's got young children to do that? No, Charles has been groomed for this. Um, He's ready and he's taking over more and more of her duties. I mean, she still works about 250 engagements a year. I mean, she is not, you know, she is not putting up her feet. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because in your piece, you talked about Mm -hmm. sort of the context of the queen's passing in the larger picture of a monarchy in transition. So... In the bigger picture, to to the world that you described, that's yeah. basically only ever known one queen. Yeah. Uh, what kinds of things come into play when this happens? So you've got things. So I mean, the first thing is that you know Charles has to figure out what name he wants to be known as because it's not obvious that it's going to be. Is it going to be Charles III? Yes, but he could pick other names. He's Charles Philip Arthur George. He could technically pick any so of those. Could pick any of those. King he could George. be. He would be King George the Seventh. His grandfather was King George I didn't the Sixth. Know that. So he could be King George VII. Well, his grandfather was Prince Albert. But when his brother, older brother, abdicated, you know, which was a huge scandal, rocked the, the throne to the foundations, he picked the name of his father. So, you know, George V, George VI, simply for continuity. Hmm. Um, he can pick any name he wants. So, And then what you also have to have is you have to have, there'll be an accession council, which is a, a special version of the Privy Council will meet. You have to swear O's. Parliament has to be recalled because everyone has to swear an oath to the new monarch. And you've got this whole Wait, wait, they have to come and, like, bend the knee? No, no, no. You're simply, you just, you go back to, Parliament will get, usually get recalled within a a few days. You swear an an oath of allegiance to the new king. You you have an oath to allegiance to the the queen when they, when they are sworn in. And that's it. These are the kinds of things I've never thought about having never seen this happen. Because you were born a Canadian. If you're if you're if you've ever been to a citizenship ceremony, you swear allegiance to the Queen because she is the head of right. state. Because she is the and this is what people don't understand. And this is when I was at this uh, this conference um, that was in University of Toronto last week. It was organized uh, by the Institute for the Study of the Crown in Canada. And one of the big things is that most people don't understand what the Crown is. It's it's at the heart of our entire country. And yet, because we don't study civics really anymore. People don't understand it. And basically what you've got is is 
the, the monarch is the living embodiment of the state. And so the state always continues, but the monarchs can come and go. The king is dead, long live the queen. The queen is dead, long live the king. Right. And so you've got, she is the physical embodiment of that. And everything really flows from that. So you've got, you know, judicial power flows from the crown. Legislative power flows from the crown. Executive power flows from the crown. Everything flows from that. And it is monarchical. So you have to change everything over. And let's face it, you know, when we're actually talking about the inevitable, when it happens, it'll be 10 days of British precision. They have Mm. everything planned to the second if you're ever out sometimes 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, you'll see an entire carriage procession going by. And they've got men with stopwatches at the top because they know how long does it take to slow march from St. James's Palace to Westminster Hall where her coffin, where she will lie in state for four days. It takes exactly 28 minutes. They know it because they have timed it repeatedly. Mm. And it, everything is going to be very precise. And you're going to have this in Canada too. What will the changing of monarchs mean for the future Mm -hmm. of the monarchy? There are a lot of people who want to abolish it, and Mm -hmm. there is a school of thought that that the longevity and popularity of this queen was one of the things kind of holding that back. Yeah. There's a lot of people who will say, I'm a Republican, but I like her. Uh, Or I'm a Republican, and I adore her, because she has been the ultimate constitutional monarch. She knows her bounds. She knows where she can go. And the question is, is this the time when you've got the changing? You know, I don't think you're going to say it at the twilight of your your reign. I'm sorry, you had a really long reign, but we're going to, you know, we're going to throw you over. Goodbye. Yeah, no. Uh, I think everyone's realized that's not going to happen. But is now the time? So, like, Australia's thinking, I was talking with one of the... Uh, the private secretaries for uh, the governor of Queensland. And he said, you know, we think eventually we're going to have another referendum on the monarchy. The last one, which was back in the 90s, was defeated. And it was simply because they couldn't find a better system. And that's Mm -hmm. also the case. Um, But you also have a a case of, you know, if you're going to start opening things up, the problem in Canada, of course, is the crown is at the very heart of the constitution. So you're not just making a tiny tweak. So what would have to change? You would simply have to rip out and rip out the constitution. It needs unanimous consent, all provinces, everything. Mm. It's, yeah. <laughs> to which everyone's <laughs> kind of going, oh my. Yeah. Um, it can be done. There are ways you can tweak it. And there are ways that some people think it could also mark a rejuvenation of the crown. So one of the men who was speaking was uh, Senator Serge Joyal, who has, I mean, he's worked with something like 10, I think, governor generals, and as Secretary of State was on uh, multiple uh, royal tours, he is, he's very much a monarchist. And he's thought really deeply about this. And he's actually concerned about a few things that he thinks are diminishing the role of the crown in Canada. Hmm. And he doesn't think it's a good thing. And especially the governor general, who's, of course, the queen's representative here, her role in the legislative process in that normally what happens is has to give royal assent for everything, of course, to become law, but only now has to go into parliament to do the signing twice a year. Doesn't have to do it more. They don't want to. So they do a bulk signing? No, they just, they, somebody else can sign it. Okay. Um, it can be a, a Supreme Court justice can sign it. And he was quite critical. He did not name names, but it was clear what he was intending on. Is it the choices of who are, who become governor general? Because he really says the role of the crown is very much shaped by the personalities of those who inhabit the roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, the governor generals, the lieutenant's governor, and one of his big criticisms is that he thinks that the, that the governor generals are too young because this should be the culmination of a long career. They shouldn't be thinking about what's the next thing that they're going to do after this, that this is just, oh, it's a five-year thing and then I'm yep. going to go on to do something else. These are the things that people never talk about that are kind of behind the scenes. And I think that in many ways is one of the issues about the crown is that I, in my article, I talk about the fact that it's like vaccines. Um, they're almost, it's almost been too successful. And so that it's become simply assumed it's always going to be there. Therefore, why do you need to have it? Because often what they do when they're talking with the government, when they're talking about issues that might be a, a conflict, so that there might be an issue where the government and crown might be in conflict, it's done behind the scenes. It's done very quietly. 
Somebody called it, it's the fire extinguisher on the wall getting dusty. You don't ever want to take it down because that's way too public. You want to keep it on the wall and work out the problem and put out the fire. And they've done this to such an extent that when things kind of come up and they're public, people are, are taken aback. I think it would help if, if people knew what the Crown did. And again, that goes back to school. I mean, the fact that there's one half course in Ontario is the only mandated civics course in the country is crazy. Will that knowledge or lack of knowledge get better or worse when we actually confront a transition in the monarchy? I'm hoping it'll get better because what will happen, there'll be a flood of interest in what is this? Yes. I mean, the first question is going to be, what is the crown? I mean, when we read the headline yeah. of your piece, yeah. it, it was a it was a profoundly interesting question because we've never encountered it. Yeah, and getting I'm ready for the inevitable. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just kind of, you know, nobody wants to talk about death. I mean, nobody wants to talk about death. But, I mean, crown experts, and, and there were so many at this conference that came from, from all over the world, you know, their careers are talking about issues with the crown. And there have been, there has been a bubbling up recently of issues involving the crown. So 2008, uh, Stephen Harper was facing a potential defeat in the House of Commons. He wanted to prorogue Parliament, he went to the Governor General. And the question was, should the Governor General have allowed him to do it? And she did. And most experts think, yes, that was, she was probably mm-hmm. right, but she has the right to say no. Another case came up very recently in British Columbia because um, they had an election. It was very, very close, the party standings. And the Premier, who is a Liberal, went to the Lieutenant Governor and wanted a dissolution, wanted to go to the polls again. And she said no. She then called the NDP leader and said, can you form a government? And the NDP leader is now the premier. He could form a government. He could put together a coalition. And that is her right. They had just gone to the polls. They weren't. She didn't want to have them thrown back into the polls without talking to other leaders about whether they have. And that that is the right of the crown. And so some people, you know, think, oh, you know, what can the crown do? The crown actually has a lot of reserve powers because a lot of the powers, it's, they're unwritten um, they're not spelled out. And so people assume that the crown is fixed. It's a rock. It's immobile. We know everything about it. It's boring. Mm-hmm. It's never going to change. And one one man said, he says, it's like water. It's, it's malleable. It's always changing. Give me an example from that conference of how drastically things can change for how the crown does business with one of its realms. So what you have is when you had the colonial situation, you really had one crown. But now there are 16 crowns, the 16 realm countries. Um, So when you look at the crown in Canada versus the crown in, say, New Zealand, and this is one that came out in in the conference, they are actually organized and run now completely differently. I mean, a lot of the basic fundamentals are the same. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the monarch is the same. But how they're run. And so what what came out was, um, especially in New Zealand, is... One of the experts was David Williams. He's from the University of Auckland. He called it the shape-shifting crown. And so there they've got the Treaty of Watangi between the Maori and the crown from 1840. And for a long time, it was really ignored. It was, you know, it was there, but, you know, like our situation with our crown's relationship with the indigenous people here, uh, the government's relationship with the individual indigenous people here, it was, you know, in name only. That has all completely changed since about the early 2000s, um, especially the Treaty of Watange is now at the foundational document of that country, and it affects the entire, everything to do with that country. And he was giving examples. He was saying that when it, it can be the biggest thing or the smallest thing. And one example he gave is when diplomats present their credentials, you would present them to the governor general. Well, they have completely reorganized that whole process. So now when the diplomats come, they first meet with the local Maori. They talk to the local Maori. They meet the local Maori. There's a guard from from the local tribe there. And only then, once that's happened, do they then meet the governor general. And it's little, it can also be tiny little things. So it can be um, the fact that the robes of the Supreme Court justices there used to be the big, the red robes that we're used to here. They're now black and they have embroidery, which has Mar- his significance for the Maori people. Hmm. And it's also the, the bigger thing. So you've got, as he said, his university has a provost who is in charge of Maori relations. So it's becoming simply embedded in the, in the DNA of Australia in a way that is not yet here. You can see changes here, but it would be interesting to see what happens in 20 years from now here, 
versus what's already happening in New Zealand. Is there concern amongst Canadian monarchists that the Queen's passing will kind of begin the end or begin something totally different for the monarchy in Canada? Or is it just going to be business as usual? I guess, like, are we going to put Charles on our money as soon as he becomes king? I mean, the question about Charles and the money, it it keeps coming up. That is actually a a decision that will have to be made. He technically does not have to be on the money. I would like to see him on the money. Um, I feel like a lot of Canadians would not. I'm I'm making that up. And that could very well be, yeah. I think a lot of the changes are going to come slowly. Like, I think some of the fundamental changes will come Mm -hmm. slowly. The question is going to be, like, when does he do a coronation tour? I mean, to be honest, we didn't really have the queen. The queen was, you know, a seat of the throne in 52. She came here for a tiny little visit in 57, but she didn't really come for her next big visit until 59. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, seven years, that's a long time. I don't think we're going to see that. But the thing is, it's not so much Charles— this is a this is an institution that's been around for a thousand years, and they take a long time. Yeah. And they know, you know, Charles. No, he's seventy. He's not hip and glamorous. Will and Kate are. Harry and Meghan are. You know, you've always got the next generation. That's the one thing about a monarchy, right? You've got the next generation. It is very much a family. Our culture demands change a lot faster <laughs> than the royal family it delivers. It does, but you, when you look when you look at the monarchy, I mean, everyone who everyone who looks at the crown, you know, we're now up to what the mid sixties. Look at how it functions in that Netflix series then, mm-hmm. and look at the look at the monarchy today. It's a radically different institution. It's simply that they move at a slower pace that you don't always notice those changes. When you go back to your question, are monarchists anxious about the change? I think many are, because it is the unknown. We've known who the queen is for so long, and this is simply the unknown. But that, in a way, makes it interesting. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is the one thing that everyone was talking about at the conference was, and it wasn't, you know, negative that the queen is, you know, what's going to happen after the queen, but it's simply that it's simply going to be something we have have never witnessed. You know, when I look back, I was talking with my, uh, with my mother, and, you know, she remembers the the death of the last king, and she said she was in a hospital. And the reason she found out was that all of a sudden, everything went very quiet. She went out into the hallway, and the doctors and nurses were weeping. Mm. And they were openly weeping for this man because he, he'd gotten them through the war. Right. Um, they had all been together, and they knew he was woefully ill-prepared for the, for the crown, but he stepped up, he did his duty, you know, and it was that war generation. And, and I remember I asked her not that long ago, I said, said, do you think they'll be like, it'll be like that for this queen? And she looked and she said, I don't know, but I think so. I think it's going to take people off guard by how much they actually like this lady, how much they miss this lady, how much they respect this lady and what she's done. She's doing it all so that she can pass it on to the next generation. She's not doing it for her own, you know, glory. She's not doing it to be a celeb, to be on a cover of any magazine. She's doing it to pass on the institution better to the next generation. And that's her entire goal. Patricia Treble is a veteran royal watcher and reporter. Find her at McLean's and at rightroyalty.com. And that was The Big Story. For more from us, you can find us at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn. And of course, you can find us everywhere. You get podcasts, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, CastBox, Luminary. Pick your favorite. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.